Praise the Lord, everybody. Ooh, I'm loud. I'm loud. All right. Let me pull that down a little bit. How's that? Is that better? Maybe. I'll pull back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's so good to be here again tonight. Going to learn about Acts some more. Um, I've been enjoying Brother LJ's Bible studies. How about you? Yeah. Love them. So um, we're going to sing about the crimson stream of blood, his beautiful blood that washes us white as snow. I see a crimson stream of blood that flows from Calvary. reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from God. Thank you, God, for dying on the cross for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for washing us white as snow. God, for redeeming us, God, and for giving us a hope and a future, Lord Jesus. We glorify you and thank you, Lord, for all you're going to do. Speak to us tonight, Lord Jesus, and help us, God, to hear from your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, we are in Acts 13 tonight. Oh, 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 sorry, give it away, give it away. We'll stay right there. We'll hang out right there for a little bit. A few years ago, our general conference was up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And one of our pastor's wives booked his airfare for him. She went on the airline website and she saw Ontario CA. And she thought, oh, that must be Ontario, Canada. So she booked his airfare. <laughs> I'd love to see the look on his face. When he ended up in Ontario, California not Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It was trying to get up here and ended up all the way over here. Yeah, because obviously there's more than one Ontario in the world. Like we mentioned, there's more than one Mount Vernon and there is more than one Antioch. And there's an Ontario, Ohio. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. So obviously an easy mistake. We're going to start off tonight in Acts 13 in Antioch, and we're, for the most part, going to end up tonight in Antioch, but we're not in the same Antioch. So that's where it can get a little confusing. So let me just kind of give you some context. We're going to start right here at Antioch. Remember, this is the Antioch that had the street lights. This is the Antioch, 600,000 people. This is the Antioch where if you stood in the middle of the street, for the most part, if you stood there long enough, you would see who you're looking for because they're going to come from here down through Antioch or from Jerusalem up through Antioch. They were going to stop here. It's kind of a grand central station of the ancient world. 
So this is the Antioch where the church starts. But by the time we get to the end of Acts 13, they're going to come from here through here through here, and they're going to end up right around here at this Antioch in Pisidia. It's a different Antioch, so I just want to get, let you know, lay some groundwork to let you know, don't get confused, we're not the same Antioch. Now in the church that was at Antioch, that was the big one. In Syria, yes, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So we're going to meet our team of apostolic leaders. Paul calls, or Saul, I'm sorry, Luke, rather, <laughs> who wrote Acts, he calls them prophets and teachers. And when I read it, it plays a little bit like a basketball starting lineup. You have five players, five prophets and teachers. And at point guard is Barnabas, my guy. What do we know about Barnabas? He is my favorite. He is a second man. He is an encourager. He's a people pepper-upper. He believes in people. That's Barnabas. Then there's Simeon, who was then the Bible says it was also called Niger. The word Niger means dark or black. So it's most likely Simeon was black. Some people believe this is a Simeon who carried Jesus' cross. I think that'd be awesome if it was, but we don't have historical evidence that say it is. And perhaps the same reason, the reason we think that is because who knows where Simeon was from who carried Jesus' cross? Yes, exactly. Si Simeon was from Cyrene in the Gospels. The very next person mentioned is Lucius from Cyrene. So you see Simeon, see Cyrene, put them together and think, hey, that must be the same guy, but maybe not. Could be, maybe not. Then there's a guy by the name of Menaean. The Bible teaches us that he grew up with Herod the Tetrarch. That was Herod Antipas. That was Herod who killed John the Baptist. Herod who tried to kill Jesus but couldn't get anything out of him, sent him, returned him to send her back to Pilate, let Pilate deal with him. It's very interesting to me. The Bible says they grew up together, played at the same playground together. They hung out together. And yet one of them went off to follow Jesus. Another of them killed John the Baptist and would have killed Jesus if he could have. And the only difference, most likely, between the two paths in life, between one who grew up to follow Jesus and one who grew up to try to kill him, choices for the most part. It would appear, like we learned last time, Herod Antipas was probably not a really great guy, loved power, and yet Menaean loved God. It's interesting how even you could have in your own family, you could have children who learned the same, who went to the same Sunday school, went to the same church, went to the same camp, went to the same services, and yet one of them said, I will follow Jesus, and another says, I want nothing to do with him. It's very interesting. A lot of it deals with choices. And then we have at the center, Saul. This is the lineup we see here in Acts chapter 13, the five who are called prophets and teachers. And it's interesting to me that this is the five, and we've heard of Barnabas and Saul. The other three, never heard of them. But they were a part of the people God used, spirit-filled, spirit-led leaders of this New Testament church in Antioch. And the Bible says that they ministered to the Lord. That's amazing to me. When we come into service, God ministers to us, and yet we have an opportunity to minister to him. Isn't it neat to know that we can bless God? We can worship him, and our worship, our devotion... The life we live ministers unto the Lord. It's not a one-way street. He blesses us, but we have the opportunity, the holy opportunity to bless him. And then they prayed over Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul. These guys are great, love what they're doing, but I want him and I want him and I want both of them together to go out into the world and preach the gospel. So the church prays over Barnabas and Saul and they lay hands on them, and they ordain them. They send them out to this missionary journey. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they also, it's almost like Luke remembers. Oh, wait. That's right, John Mark was with them. So it's almost like Luke remembers. Oh, they also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island, it's like, hey, there you go, John. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, there's another one. What is his name? It's such an unusual name. John. 
Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. When you read Bar, what does that mean? Son of, son of Jesus. He was not. Who was with the proconsul or a governor of sorts, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, which is Bar-Jesus, this sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, listen to what Saul says. Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the ways, the straight ways of the Lord? But Paul, Paul has some chutzpah. He, he got in his face. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what was done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So first stop, Holy Spirit says, separate Barnabas and Saul. I want them to go out and do the work I've called them to do. First stop, they stop here at this island of Cyprus. They start here at Antioch. They board a boat, come across the pond, and they end up at Salamis, this little city here on the island of Cyprus. And Paul had a very predictable, repeatable pattern. The Bible teaches that Paul would first go to the Jews, then the Gentiles. Acts 13, he went to the Jews. Acts 13, he went to the Gentiles. Here he goes to the Jews, then the next Gentiles. First the Jews, then the Gentiles. Romans 1, 16, the, power, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul was saying in that passage and by his pattern, he was saying, I'm going to preach to the Jews first. They were the chosen people of God from Genesis, from Abraham's day. They were the ones chosen by God. I'm going to preach to them first. And if they accept it or not, doesn't matter. I'm going to then go to the Gentiles and preach the selfsame message to them. So now we meet our sixth man here in this passage, John Mark. I didn't realize this until studying this. John Mark was Barnabas's cousin. They were family, and that is going to come in handy to know here in just a little while. So our spirit-led trio, John, Mark, Saul, Barnabas, they go from Cyprus, and they go all the way from Salamis, all the way to the other side of the island of Paphos. It's kind of like somebody saying, oh, man, I don't want to go all the way across town to Walmart. It's on the other side of town. It's going to take me six minutes to get all the way to the other side of town. Some might take you a little shorter than six minutes to get to the other side of town. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. They go all the way to the other side of the island called Paphos, and they meet two key characters. They meet a sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, or son of Jesus, and they meet a governor named Sergius Paulus. Now, Luke was complimentary. He said of Sergius Paulus, he was an intelligent man, and he was hungry. He wanted to hear the gospel. He wanted to hear what Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas had to say. But his friend, his sorcerer friend, did not want him to. Why do you think the sorcerer Bar Jesus was trying to keep Sergius Paulus from hearing the word of God? He would be out of a job. That's exactly right. Where have we seen this before? Where have we seen somebody who their whole living is based on magic and trickery and maybe even demonic power? But they come face to face with the real power of God and they realize they're no match. Where have we seen that before? I'm sorry? Yes. You got him. Drop the E on Simeon. That's correct, Simon the Sorcerer. See, you guys are so smart. Good memories. Simon the Sorcerer, he tried to keep the city of Samaria following him, but he came face to face with the real power of God. And realize I'm no match for this. And whatever this is, I want this. And even paid, offered to pay, to be able to purchase the right to do for people what Philip prayed for God to do for people. So he gets in, basically he gets in the way as Paul is trying to teach the gospel, preach the gospel. At this point he was called Saul. Now we see this change in Acts 13 where the Bible says Saul, who was also called Paul. Now long time ago, I was getting ready to preach a message, and I was so excited because Saul's life is such a miracle. I thought, oh, I'm going to preach about how God changes our name from Saul to Paul. God changes his name. 
So I did, search, I did research and study, and I realized, wait a minute, God never changed his name. His name from birth was Saul, Hebrew, Paul, Greek. John, Hebrew, Mark, Greek. So there was no name change per se. This wasn't like Jesus came down like he did for Abram and said, no longer Abram, but Abraham. Not for Jacob, but Israel. Not Sarai, but Sarah. Not this case. It was Saul, Paul. Now, why do you think, Hebo, why do you think he went by Paul? Because from the, from the rest of the point on, you don't hear him refer to himself or Luke refer to him as Saul. It's always Paul. Why do you think he goes by Paul from here on out? Sister Hines? Okay, he's got a Gentile audience, and they would identify more with a Greek name. Sister Brooks. No, 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 I, heard, I thought I heard you say something. Yes, exactly, his history. I think Saul, Paul, sorry, might have been distancing himself a little bit. Oh, I know, I know, I have a reputation. Saul Tarsus, everybody's scared, but I'm telling you, I'm not that anymore. I'm Paul. So that could have been part of the reason that he starts to go by Paul. But he's full of the Holy Spirit and still gets righteously indignant with Bar-Jesus, with Elamis. And he tells him, you will be blind for a time. Now, why would Paul feel like that would be such a major issue to say, that's it, fine, you're blind, boom, he's blind. Why would Paul say, that, that'll, that'll, that'll serve you right? Liz. I don't know. Maybe. I, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Hannah? Is it because when Paul and Saul lined up with Mark Jesus, they never realized what happened? And then it's like, okay, well, this is how it worked for me. Bam, that person was unclean. Exactly. I think that's part, that could be part. And it might be. Maybe blindness was uncleanness. But yes, I think Hannah's right on. Saul says, I'll tell you what. I thought I knew it all. I thought I could do it all. I thought I was awesome, and then all of a sudden, in a minute, I was blind, and I realized I'm powerless. And so Elamus, bar Jesus, you think you're awesome, you think you're amazing, you think you can do all these tricks, and Matt, watch, watch this. And all of a sudden, this guy who goes from pretty much telling Sergius Paulus how everything works and all that, and even tricking him, goes to needing somebody to just walk him, lead him by the hand so he doesn't walk into a wall. Like immediately, he loses all the power that he used to have, and it was all because of the power of God. Now, let me ask you this. If God gave you the opportunity to do anything to anyone, <laughs> he, basically gave, he basically gave Paul the credit card, the gilded credit card with no limit, and said, whatever you want to do to Elamus, you can do it. What, what, would you, what would you have done? If you were Paul and Elamus was getting in the way, what would you have done short of killing him? Don't kill him. Okay, make him mute. I like that one. And God did that to Zacharias. What else? What else? What else could Paul have done? This is kind of like if you, if you had a superhero power, what would it be? Well, what would you have done if you were Paul? Okay, <laughs> take away his ability to lie and deceive. You have to tell the truth. <laughs> I'm really nothing. I got no power. Everything I got is from the devil. Sorry. Got nothing for you. What, anybody else? What, what would you do? What, what would you do, Brother Potter, if you could? What would you have done? Not, I don't even know what that means, but it's funny. But it's funny. Anybody else? One more. Just. Make him deaf. Okay. So we're taking away his ability to see hear or speak all right so that's what Paul does and immediately the Bible says a dark mist fell on him he couldn't see he needed somebody to lead him by the hand and here's what's amazing to me the proconsul the governor this, this intelligent man who was hungry to hear the Word of God he believed when he saw the miracle he said wow that's amazing I believe but he was astonished at the gospel the miracle was wow okay but the gospel was, oh, my. So you're telling me God came from heaven to earth, laid his life down on one of our Roman crosses so my sins could be forgiven? 
He was astonished. The Bible says struck out of his senses at the gospel, at the teaching of the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Missy? Sergius Paulus. He was some kind of a governor of sorts. Yeah. So here's, here's where I think it, this is valuable. I believe it's God's will for us to have miracles and the gospel, but not miracles before the gospel or miracles over the gospel. In other words, it's God's will for us to preach the gospel and then he confirms the preached word through miracles. And that's what we see all throughout scripture. They preach the word and then the Lord says, and just to prove that I'm in this, watch this. And then people are healed. We'll see that in Acts 14. So it is the plan of God, will of God, for us to have both. But if we could only have one, let's go for the gospel. Let's not chase after miracles. Miracles should follow us. We should not have to chase them. Any questions before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Comment on. Oh, there, that's a good, okay, that's a great point. Maybe nobody was hanging out like, I, I ain't helping you. You don't have power anymore. I don't that, to do that's know. right. That's, I'm, I'm hitching the wagon to this guy. I saw this Paul and Barnabas guy. Yeah, okay, that's good. All right, verse number 13. Now when Paul and his party <coughs> set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia. This is this Antioch, not this Antioch. <laughs> and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word or exhortation for the people, say on. And then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. Now, did you notice the change? It is subtle, but it's there. And it's powerful. Look at verse number 13 and tell me if you notice the change. Verse 2, Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. Verse 13, now when Paul and his party, what's the change? There's been a leadership change. Barnabas was the first one mentioned. Barnabas is the one who went and got Saul before and brought him to the Christians, and yet now we see here in verse 13, and we'll see for the rest of Acts and the rest of the epistles, that Paul is the man in charge. He's the one taking charge and leading. So there's been this, it, I just could do that all the time. There's this, been this change in leadership, and they go from Paphos, which is here, and they come across this pond to Pergia and Pamphylia, and finally they end up here in Antioch in Pisidia. And that's where John Mark tells the team, it's been real, it's been fun, not been real fun, I'm out. And John Mark turns, boards a boat, and sails home. And they're really just getting started. Why, why did John Mark leave? Not yet. There's, not, there's a tiff between him and Paul, but that's in Acts 15. No, no tiff yet, at least that we know of. Luke doesn't record it. But not that we know of yet. Why do you think John Mark left? I'm sorry? He could have been homesick for mom. Sure. Like, man, I just, this is, Paul's okay, but he doesn't, he doesn't cook like mom does, so I'm out. What else? I'm sorry? <laughs> John Mark had a book to write. He had homework due. He's like, oh, man, I'm out here. I'll do with Paul this time. I'm not going to get my assignment in. I can't get my discussion post done. It's due by midnight on Monday. Oh, Liz is feeling, Liz, Liz is feeling that. I'm feeling that, too. I've got my discussion post to do also. Why else? So homesick. He had something else to do, possibly. What else? What other reasons might he have left? I'm sorry? Well, no, there are theories, but nobody knows. I just want to see what you're thinking. Persecution could have been a reason. It might have, been not, it might have gotten too hot for, Bar for John Mark, and he said, I, I didn't sign up for this. Hannah? Oh, yeah. He's here, too. Yeah. John Mark just always feels like the third reel. It's always Saul and Barnabas, and John Mark's carrying his bags. Okay. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Nobody knows. Could have been, could have felt called somewhere else. Here are some theories over why John Mark left. One, he got, no, he did not get COVID. One, he got homesick and he went home. Another one, he got sick 
and went home. Another one, he got upset and went home. Maybe, some argue, that John Mark got upset because his cousin Barnabas is not the one in charge anymore, and now he's taken orders from Paul, not from Barney. And so some argue that he got upset because there's been a change in leadership, and he didn't sign up for that. I don't know. <laughs> he might have, he might have had a paper route. We never really know. It does seem it does seem like he was probably fairly young, but I would imagine Barnabas may have been too. Saul was probably older, maybe the oldest of the three, but another another option is he got uncomfortable going and went home. Paul is preaching to Gentiles, largely to Gentiles. He's a light to the Gentiles. John Mark's Jewish. So maybe John Mark wasn't real comfortable with all these unclean, in his mind, Gentiles hearing the gospel. Or, as Jackie said, he got afraid because of persecution and went home. So all kinds of reasons for why he went home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bible says in verse. Return to Jerusalem and his mother's house was there in Jerusalem. Yep. So those are the theories, but why this is so important is because in Acts 15, when so Saul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, they continue the missionary journey, they end up coming right back where they came from, they end up back in Antioch of Syria, this Antioch, not this Antioch, they end up over here. And eventually in Acts 15, Barnabas says, hey Paul, let's bring John Mark with us. And Paul says, over my dead body. And there's this major contention and it's so sharp that Barnabas, Barnabas, who's always the guy who's got everybody's back, he can't get along with Paul. Paul can't get along with him because Barnabas says we need to take John Mark. So Barnabas and John Mark, they go on their own journey, and Paul picks up Silas, and they go on theirs. So the contention is so sharp. And that's to me, that's kind of amazing because these spirit-filled, spirit-led apostolic leaders, they couldn't get along. It, this is like middle school stuff. This is drama. This is Jerry Springer kind of stuff. They're throwing couches at each other. That's just what's going on here in the New Testament church. That gives me a little bit of hope that if we don't always get along, you know what? Neither did they. And yet they still worked together in some capacity and got the gospel out there and glorified God. So for now, our trio is down to duet. Barnabas and Paul, they're still together. They go on the Sabbath day for service in the synagogue and service was different for them than for us. David Gusick in his book, he said, this is what a synagogue service looked like. Opening prayer, then they read from the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Not all of it, but just excerpts. <laughs> read from Genesis through Deuteronomy. They'd be there every single. <laughs> then they read from the prophets. And then after that, they asked if anybody who was educated and had something to say would be wanting to say anything or comment on what they just heard from the law or the prophets. So sure enough, they're in that synagogue. They ask the question of Paul and Barnabas, how about you guys? Do you have anything you'd like to say? And Paul stands up, never going to miss this opportunity. Paul stands up and he says, to the Jews and you who fear God, who are those who fear God? Gentiles, God-fearers. Somebody asked a really good question in the morning class. They said, I thought Gentiles weren't welcome in the synagogue. That was the temple. Gentiles couldn't come to the temple past the court of Gentiles, but in the synagogue, anybody was, the Jews and God-fearers were welcome, which were Gentiles who wanted to get close to God but weren't born as Jews. They could get, they could get close to God. They could come to the synagogue. This, would, this might be what a synagogue probably felt and looked like, a group having a, a Bible study right here with the people of God. So this is Paul's chance to preach the gospel, and he's preaching to them. And he tells them, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. So he's in Genesis. He's at Abraham. Exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out. Now he's in Exodus. For a time of 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. He's gone through Numbers and Deuteronomy. And when he destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land by allotment. He's all the way through Joshua. After that, he gave them judges for 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Now he's in judges and going all the way to First and Second Samuel. He is making tracks fast. Afterward, they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he gave testimony, and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. Seven verses. That's all it took for Paul to sprint from Abraham 
to Jesus. Paul was moving. He was getting fast from the law through the prophets pointing to Jesus. And he got to Jesus. He tells them, look at the law. It points to Jesus. Look at the prophets. They point to Jesus. Look at the judges. Look at Samuel. Look at David. Look at Solomon. They all point to Jesus. And some of those, especially the Jews, they didn't realize that the law was pointing to Jesus. They knew it was pointing to a Messiah, but they didn't know Jesus was that Messiah. So Saul, who was called Paul, is connecting the dots for him. And when he finished, it was a portrait of Jesus. After John first preached, now he jumps testaments. He's into Matthew. Before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you think I am? I'll tell you who I'm not. I'm not him. I'm not even worthy to loose his sandal. Men and brethren, and sons of the family of Abraham, those among you who, here it is again, fear God. Jews, Gentiles, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, or the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? Every Sabbath you hear the prophets read, every single Sabbath, and you miss it every time. It's incredible. You can come to church. You can come to service and miss it. That's what Paul was teaching. They have fulfilled them in condemning him. Isaiah, the book of Psalms, prophesies that the Messiah will come and you will kill him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Five verses. Once he brings them to Jesus, Five verses is all it takes for Paul to walk them and lead them to the cross. Now, the Jews shuddered at the thought of the cross because it's the most cruel and shameful and embarrassing, humiliating way to die. But even more than that, Deuteronomy 21 calls everybody who hangs on a tree cursed. And Paul said, you hung him on a tree. He used his words very carefully. He was letting them know this was not just a cross. This was a tree. And the law curses anyone hung on a tree. What is Paul saying there? The Messiah is cursed. For whom? For us. God came in human flesh and suffered the curse we should suffer. He took it on himself. That's amazing grace. That's the gospel. That's at the heart of the gospel. Now, when they had fulfilled all written concerning him, they took him down from the, here it is, the tree, and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. <laughs> That's the gospel. Two verses. That's all it takes to walk him from the cross to the empty tomb. And then from verse 31 to 37, Paul quotes from the book of Psalms all about Jesus. He's quoted from the, from the law. He's quoted a bit from the prophets. Now he goes to the wisdom literature, the book of Psalms or the book of Proverbs, and he quotes from them. He was seen for many days by those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today have I begotten you. And he raised him from the dead. No more to return to corruption. He has spoken. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to see corruption. So he's walking him through the book of Psalms, telling them, you hear this stuff. This is about Jesus. It's not about David. David wrote it, but it wasn't, he wasn't the object of it. Because David, after he saw his generation by the will of God, fell asleep, he was buried, and he saw corruption. We could go right now to David's tomb, and there's not much left, but there are bones. He saw corruption. But he, God raised up, saw no corruption as a prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, okay, here he goes. He is really going to needle the Jews right now. By him, Jesus Everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Why does that sting for the Jews? Yes, it, exactly. They thought the law of Moses was the end all be all. If we can keep the law of Moses, remember, the law of Moses is how many laws? That's exactly right. 613 very faded marker. 
613 laws, and they thought, if we can just keep these laws, we're going to be okay. We'll be righteous. We'll be, we'll be right in God's sight. Remember, James said, you keep, if you break one of them, you broke them all. Good luck keeping 613. I'm sorry, not good luck. Forgive me. I pray you do well keeping 613, but you're not going to do it. James even said, there's no way anybody can do it. Paul says, there's no way anybody can do it. Nobody can keep the law. So he says, you think if you keep the law of Moses, you're going to be fine, but you're not. I'll tell you where you're fine if you obey the gospel. Now, why does this sting the Gentiles? The God-fearers. Because all these years, the Jews have told them, what you need to do is what we have done. And so they have sold their life to try to keep these 613. And Paul says, that's not, I'll tell you where it's found. <laughs> We're going to take up an offering for a little table. It's found in the cross. That's where righteousness, that's where justification is found in the cross of Christ, the gospel. So he tells them, beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken of the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers marvel and perish. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. For I work a work in your days a work, which you by, will by no means believe, though one will declare it to you. So Paul lets them know it's about the gospel, not about the law. And he preaches them to them in the synagogue. Now, and remember, he's a guest speaker. It's up for them. It's their turn to respond. He's just told them the law that won't justify you. The gospel will justify you. Forgiveness of sins is only found in Jesus Christ. But you, your religious elite, your countrymen, you crucified him. You hung him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead. How are they going to respond to that? Here's how. When the Jews went out of the synagogue, no response from the Jews. We have no idea really how they responded. But how did the Gentiles respond? Oh, would you please come back next Sabbath and you, I, I, want, you to, I want you to preach this again. Would you please come back and preach this again? It's interesting, too. They don't say, oh, that was a good message. What else do you have? They said, I want to hear more about this God who came and became a curse for us so we could be made right. I want to hear more about the gospel. I love that. When we read all the way through the, through the book of Acts so far, we've seen at least three times now where people needed to hear the gospel, and Peter preached it. He started in, I forget if he was Exodus or Genesis, but he walked them through history and came to the cross. And didn't Stephen do the same thing? Walked him through history, came to the cross. The Ethiopian eunuch did the same thing. Walked him from Isaiah, brought him to the cross. And here we see that Paul walks them from Genesis and brings them to the cross. Every one of them preached the gospel because the gospel is the only message with the power to make us right with God. And now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded or persuaded them, yes, to continue in the grace of God. So there were those devout Jews. There were some of those who said, I want to hear the gospel again. I want to hear what you have to say. When you come back next Sabbath, don't change the channel. Preach the same message you preached to us this Sabbath. I want to hear the gospel. And then they do come back the next Sabbath and things get dicey. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came to hear the word of God. That's awesome. That's revival. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Saul. Paul, Paul, Paul. So Paul and Barnabas come to the synagogue and the whole city practically comes out to hear the gospel. And the Jews who are there get upset. Why? Been able to do what? Bring them all in. Yes. Yes, exactly. So think about it. If, if you've got 20 people, every Sabbath day, whatever, they come together, you've got 20 people. Then you've got these two guys who come in from who knows where, and they all of a sudden, two, two services is all it takes to get the whole city out to hear them. They got upset. They got envious. They're like, hey, that's not fair. One service? That's a great point. So it's just one service. You're absolutely right. One service is all it takes. It's even worse for the Jews. Oh, man, come on. 
One service is all it takes. And so the Jews get upset. And the Bible says they contradicted Paul. So while Paul is teaching and preaching the gospel, I can hear them say, well, he says, now you know that David saw corruption, but the Messiah Jesus never saw corruption. Yes, he did. And Jesus became a curse for us. No, he didn't. Like you just, they contradicted Paul. Everything he would try to say, they would say, no, that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> we went to, went to a nursing home service one time, and I remember, <laughs> nursing home services are so special. I remember one time, one sweet lady, she just all of a sudden, we're teaching, preaching, whatever it was. I promise it was true. It was straight from the word of God. And she said, lies. They're all lies. She got so upset, so animated. I and mean, what do you do in a situation like that? And that's what they're doing. They're contradicting and opposing Paul and Barnabas because they want the crowd to follow them. But that's not what's going on here. They're hearing the gospel. Some of them may have been hearing the gospel for the very first time. And they heard it. And God dealt with their heart. And they said, wow, he did that for me. And it changed them. But when Paul and Barnabas grew bold, and he tells them it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Okay, we came to you first. You know our pattern. We came to you first. You heard the word of God, but since you reject it and you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded, I've set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And now when the Gentiles heard the same message, and they heard that they had the opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. They were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. It's an amazing move of God where the gospel touched the hearts of the Gentiles when they realized he did it for me. Gentiles were thrilled. The word of God spread through the region teaching us that if one group won't hear it, another group will. I want to be among those who hear the word of God, respond to it. I don't want him going somewhere else. I want him to come right here. I want him to go and, and minister to, but I don't want him to leave us to go minister to somebody else. God, pour out your spirit on every church in Mount Vernon, but while you're doing it, pour out your spirit right here. I want you to do what you want to do right here. Do it elsewhere, but don't do it elsewhere without first stop by here do what you want to do here but the jews <laughs> stirred up the devout and prominent women okay this is awesome ladies in a in a culture where women were property and treated as property when the men wanted to get the attention of the city they said we need some ladies on our side and so they stirred up the devout and prominent women and chief men of the city. So they realized these ladies have more value than we give them credit for. And they raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expel, expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So by the time we get to J Acts 13, the Jews were upset. The religious were upset. The prominent women and the chief men were upset. I heard one person tell me one time, you know if it's a successful meeting, if everybody left happy or everybody left mad. Well, it's a smashing success because everybody, except the Gentiles, is upset. And on the way out of town, Paul and Barnabas, symbolically, I don't even know how you shake the dust off your feet. I guess you kind of go like that or you wipe your feet or whatever, but they shake the dust off their feet. What does that mean? Yes, we are done with you. That's kind of like in our day we say, that's it, I'm done. That's what they did. They shook the dust off their feet, and Jesus said to do so. Jesus said, if you go into a city and they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Let it be a sign against them that says, we tried, you rejected us. That's between you and God. You'll answer for that. We're going to go share the gospel with somebody else. Yes, ma'am? Oh my. Oh my. This is middle school stuff right here. Wow. In case you didn't hear it, Sister Hines, and for those online, Sister Hines said in Jewish custom, some of them would have a foot washing service to get the dust of that particular city off their feet before they went to another city. Now, and I did read in one place that if a Jew went into a Gentile's 
a business or home or something like that, they would have a foot washing to get the dust off of their feet because it was unclean to have Gentile dust on Jewish feet. Boy, racism was just so, so prominent back in that day, which is why there's this sharp division between Jews and Gentiles, and yet the cross erases it. Remember, the cross erases the line and says everybody who's hungry can hear and respond to the gospel. So they came there. The Jews said, we don't want it. They said, we shake the dust off our feet. We're going to get out of here. They go to Iconium. And then the scripture says they're expelled out of town. They're rejected. They're persecuted. And how do they respond? They respond filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. You can't stop the church. Whatever you try, try persecution, try contradiction, try demonic power, whatever you try. God is greater. You can't stop the church. And that's how we end with Acts 13. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there, is there a theory for why there's a shift between Barnabas to, or from Barnabas to Paul? A good question. We know when Jesus spoke to Paul on the road to Damascus, he told him, I'm going to use you. You will be my light to the Gentiles. And certainly while others preached to the Gentiles, the one who really would be the leader of that group would be Paul. So at some point, there had to be a shift. Barnabas was one of those guys. He was a lot like Andrew. If you remember Andrew in the Gospels, Andrew was never a real upfront kind of guy. He wasn't the one to preach on Pentecost. He wasn't one of those we read even about in the book of Acts. But Andrew's gift was someone else needs to hear this. I'll go get my brother. Somebody has a lunch here. I'll go find it and give it to Jesus. It's kind of Barnabas is like that. Barnabas is not, he may not be a real upfront guy. In fact, we're going to see here soon where Barnabas and Paul go into a city, and Paul is the chief speaker. Pretty much everywhere it's always Paul is the one speaking. He's the one out in front. So he is the leader. At some point, that had to happen. Barnabas appears to be okay with it, though, which, again, that's kingdom-minded. It's not about me. It's about him. So whoever gets the glory, he gets the glory. So it doesn't matter who gets the credit here. He gets the glory. Good question. Anyone else? Any other questions about Acts 13? Okay, let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to use us. I do believe that it's his will for us to preach the gospel, and then his will to, see, for, to confirm that word with miracles. So let's pray that God would do that through us and use us to reach people and lead us to hungry people like Sergius Paulus, who wanted to hear the word of God, and lead us to those who want to hear and will hear his word. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for what you shared with us tonight through your word. I pray tonight, help us to be more like you, God. Draw us closer to you. I know there are hungry people right here in this city. This is your city, Lord. We ask you to please minister through us to others. Lead us to men like Sergius Paulus. Lead us to people who are hungry for your word and help us when we meet them to preach the gospel, share the gospel with them. I ask you, Lord, to bring revival. Lord, while you're pouring out your spirit in churches all across this county, pour out your spirit right here. In fact, I pray God spark a revival right here. I ask you to work miracles and wonders right here. God, I ask you to do what you want to do and go out from here to minister to our county. I pray, Lord Jesus, show yourself strong here just as you did in the book of Acts. I pray these things in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for being here next week. We're going to look at Acts 14, so please read that and be ready to learn what happens in Acts 14 as the story continues. We do have a cornbread country ham and bean dinner Sunday, which there are tickets right here on this chair. You don't need a ticket to come, but please use those to give those to others. That way they can know when and where and all of that and invite somebody to come and, and fellowship with us. We're going to have great worship, a great service, a move of God, and then fellowship right after. So invite somebody to come with us. I think Bishop has tickets there. Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Man, that was a quick answer to prayer. And for our next trick. <laughs> yes. Excellent.
and this is the live stream of 